I am Jimbo Paris, and you are listening to the Jimbo Paris Show. Welcome again to the Jimbo Paris Show. We have Charles Free, CEO of Code Exitos. Again, very cool name. Let's see what it's about. Hey, Jimbo, let's how are you, man? Yeah, good, good, good. But let's get started here. So specifically, who are you? Yeah. Well, uh, Charles Fry, or when I'm in Latin America, I use Carlos a lot. So that's why my, whoop, the other way, my name there is, shows Charles or Carlos. Either one is fine. I'm 58 years old. I've been a tech entrepreneur my whole life. And um, currently, as you mentioned, I'm the CEO and the founder of a product development studio called Code Exitos. And Code Exitos has people and offices, design centers, in the United States, Mexico, and Latin America. So, yeah, we're focused on the Americas. How long have you actually been in this industry? I did my first tech startup right after I got out of the University of Michigan in, let's see, I finished there in 1986. I think it was 1988 when I did my first startup. So that's a long time. Mm. But I've survived. <laughs> Your career, you know, can you give us a bit of a brief history about that too? You know, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, no one talked about being an entrepreneur. It was almost like you couldn't get a real job. You know, everybody expected you to go work for a company that was already established. But I was early in the technology uh, space as a software developer, and I liked working for lots of different people. And so almost started out like self-employment. And then as I got traction and I realized I had more work than I could do myself and I had to hire people, then you realize that it's like, wow, man, this is starting to feel like a company. You know, over the years, I had a lot of good mentors, uh, a lot of positive experiences, some tough experiences as well. Yeah, the, the ventures got a little more serious and a little more successful and and I stuck at it. I've done startups that have been bootstrapped, you know, credit cards and the cash I had available. I've done venture backed startups where, you know, big time venture capitalists are involved. Tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars are flying around. I've sold companies and I've bought companies and I've helped people turn around companies. So I've done a little bit of everything in the last 30 or 35 years. But my passion has always been around starting and building things from scratch. So that's my jam. Speaking of passion, you know, you were a biology and molecular biology major, correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So why'd you, why'd you get into tech? Yeah, it's a great question. And it, you have to kind of be in the history machine to understand it. But again, in the 1980s, when I was in the laboratory uh, studying biochemistry or molecular biology, personal computers were just becoming available. And to be honest, they didn't do much, Jimbo. You, hmm. you could get a word processor and maybe a crude spreadsheet. So if you wanted it to do anything, you had to write program it yourself. That actually always, that programming part to me was fascinating because it, it seemed pretty logical to me. It wasn't difficult. Uh, it was a lot simpler back then than it is today. And I discovered that for a lot of people it was really confusing and even intimidating computer technology for me it was intuitive and I had an ability gift that I could explain it to people. And mm. So, so people actually ask me, they're like, hey, can I pay you to help with this? Back in those days, Jimbo, if you got a computer science degree, it was all about dealing with mainframes and big, you know, big systems that we don't even really use that much anymore. Personal computers, you went to the store and bought one and figured it out on your own. And certainly no one was teaching entrepreneurship. It's funny, today I go back to the University of Michigan and I, I actually speak. They have a great program for entrepreneurs in the business school. And uh, I go back as a speaker now to talk about entrepreneurship. I'm like, man, where was all this when I was here? I would have signed up for this. When it comes to the businesses you built, what was the most notable startup you've made? And why was it so notable to you? Wow. That's like having to pick your favorite child. I don't know if uh, I don't know if that's a fair question. They all had attributes that I enjoyed. 
I, I would say code exitos right now. The the one I'm doing right now, and this is a comment that I suppose only a career entrepreneur can make, but this is my last company. This is the last company I want to build. I wanted to achieve two things with, well, a lot, but two primary things when I was thinking about starting Code Exitos. One is that I wanted the company to last um, the rest of my career. It was the last thing I was going to do. So I don't have any outside investors. I don't plan to sell the company. I don't have any, you know, we're not going to take it public. We want to, we want to make it last. The other thing is I was very interested in finally being able to give back some public benefit through what I knew how to do best, which was commerce, you know, commercial uh, business. So we're a public benefit company and we take very seriously the fact that not only do we have to honor the commitments that we make to our customers and our clients for producing fantastic software products for them, but we also owe our team and the communities that our teams live in the opportunity to improve their careers, uh, make a better than average wage, and and create more opportunity as we go. So those two things were very important when I was thinking about what I wanted to do next. And so that's those are kind of at the foundation of Code Exitos. So it makes it special and current for me. When it comes to the best startup, again, again, you've, you've already chosen it, but what is the process to sort of choosing that best startup? Yeah, it's a great question. I've had a lot of people ask me that over the years. And for a while, I actually worked for some VCs. I would just, I helped them review business plans and talk to entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs, especially uh, early in the process. And I think probably the smartest thing that I ever came, that it came out of my mouth with regard to this was to tell entrepreneurs that they should be deeply passionate about what they're doing and they would be willing to do it for the rest of their lives free if necessary not be guaranteed you know you may not get that big venture capital investment you may not get that public offering you may not have someone buy it for millions or billions of dollars but you still need to be fulfilled personally and happy with the career Mm -hmm. you've chosen so Yeah, I I would say that's the most enduring advice I've seen. And the people that really genuinely enjoy the company that they're building, they seem to do better in the long run. There have been periods over the years where, you know, doing a startup becomes almost like a fashion statement or a fad. And (laughs) people want to cash in on the venture capital boom or the IPO boom or something like that. And I remember that I would, I could always tell this because I'd start seeing very senior executives from big companies show up for job interviews, or they'd show up to pitch their business plan. And this man or woman might be making, you know, a huge salary at a big company. And you look at their resume and their whole career was with big multinational companies. And I'd say, you know, why do you want to, why do you want to start this company? And they'd say, well, because I'm going to get venture capital and it'll be easy. And, and then I'm going to, you know, sell it. And I'm going to make millions. And I'm like, but you didn't say anything about being in love with the idea. Doing it for money is the wrong reason to start a company. You have to do it for passion. That's, that's what it all boils down to in my book. Well, when we go next from passion now, maybe to a budget, how much mm-hmm. money should someone commit in order to make sort of a commercial grade business? Or how much do they need? Maybe? Well, those are two really different things. Um, in in my case, and I think my case is pretty consistent, companies always seem to need a whole lot more money than I thought they were going to need when I planned how much I had or how much I was going to need. So the difference between what you plan to need and what you really need uh, can be pretty pretty different. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. There's some guidelines and you have to be aware of them. So for example, if I told you I was going to build a steel mill, you know, I was going to build a brand new steel mill that would cost millions and millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars because I'd have to build a factory and I'd have to have all the machinery and 
Even before I started the company, I'd have all of these fixed assets that I would need to buy. That's much different than if I said that I was going to start a talent agency and I was going to go out and be a talent agent and I was going to sign you up and get you a monster deal with uh, Sony, for example. And you would agree, you know, I would use my connections and my salesmanship and I'd make money when I got you a deal, right? That doesn't take nearly as much money to get started. I have to stay alive. I have to eat. I have to take care of my family. I might have some travel expenses, buy a new suit or something like that. But it's nothing like a business that requires a lot of assets. So the specific answer to your question depends on the kind of company. But when you do your planning, at a minimum, I think you should expect that it's going to take, well, actually, I don't know if it's a minimum or not. What I've what I tell people now is it's going to take twice as long and cost twice as much to accomplish what you want to do. And uh, that, that feels about right most of the time. Okay. Maybe I didn't hone in perfectly on that question. So perhaps okay. maybe instead of looking at a whole business, what about just a commercial grade application? Like something. Oh, like a piece of software. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm 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 sorry. I didn't understand your question. All right. Yeah, that was that was um, on me. Yeah, I think that um, I like the fact that you call it a commercial grade piece of software, and I'm going to assume that you're not going to do any of the software engineering yourself, and you're going to want to have a team do it. Um, typically, what we're seeing today is entrepreneurs are spending anywhere from 50 to $150,000 for the building process. Uh, it depends a lot on the complexity of the software, um, whether it's a B2B application or it's a consumer application. But to get a real commercial quality product out the door, whether you're paying some for someone to do it or they're doing it in exchange for what they would be able to charge in the marketplace, I think anything less than about fifty thousand dollars is really, really hard to do these days. So, okay. uh, does, that, does that get a little closer to what you were asking about? Exactly. Exactly. Now, just to kind of jump back more to you, sure. you kind of worked off a lot on this quote here, and it's called "Build something great from nothing." Why does that quote resonate with you so much? I think that that's what most technology entrepreneurs can do. And we're, have, we're hosting, uh, we're the uh, principal sponsor of a conference for what we call digital creators. And it includes content creators now. I think this is a really amazing thing. Unlike the steel mill example I gave, people with smart minds and visions and ambition can get into these kind of businesses for very, very little money compared to traditional, you know, manufacturing kind of retail businesses. And that's great. It unlocks and unleashes a lot of creativity. And so I just love the idea of creating something and seeing how far a team can push it. And there's a little bit of luck involved for some of the breakthroughs. It's not easy in the sense that anyone can do it, but the barrier to entry and the barrier to becoming an entrepreneur is a lot lower in tech and digital businesses. And I just think that's awesome. It, it just opens up a whole new economic world for people. You just raised a very, very interesting point there. What do you mean by barrier? The example's a little absurd, but the steel mill example you know, you might have a fantastic idea about how to make steel better than anyone else. But if you can't, you know, get a hundred million dollars, I have no idea, by the way, I have no idea what it costs to open a steel mill, but let's say it's a hundred million dollars. Getting access to a hundred million dollars becomes a barrier for you. You can't start to make your idea real until you get that hundred million dollars and you build the steel mill. If you know how to program or you teach yourself enough programming, if, if you have to go really low, you know, low budget, uh, and you have an idea for a mobile app, that was the last big wave of kind of cool, cheap, easy, fun entrepreneurship. If you had an idea and you released an app called Angry Birds, 
you did really, really well on a really small investment and you didn't get nearly as dirty as you would building a steel mill. So when we talk about barriers to a business, we mean anything that's blocking you from having kind of this breakthrough opportunity. It could be you don't have access to capital. You have competitors that are far better financed than you. Um, well, who knows why? But that's what I mean by barrier. Entrepreneurs are too smart for their own good, me included. And what I mean by that is you're like, oh, yeah, and we're going to deliver groceries and we're going to we're going to be, you know, giving kids rides. And they think of all these features and it's too much. You have to hone in on what is the one killer cool thing that you're going to do to capture customers. Once you capture them with that really cool thing, you can keep adding more features and services in, but you have to get the first thing right. Would you sort of say kind of these enterprise applications are kind of a good thing in society now, especially during like the pandemic times? Applications that are focused on a large scale theme. So like think applications run by large corporations. So things like mm. Instagram and anything run by Meta, those types of things. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's a whole other show right there. Generally, no. I think it started out as the right idea and it's turned into something that no one expected and we don't know how to undo it. So let's take Meta and let's take Google as examples. They're not free and they've never been free, but the way... I guess I believe very much what Tim Cook at Apple says. They monetize their users. And I think users have to be aware, and we're not. We kind of sleepwalk through it. We click the I accept the user agreement, I accept, I accept, because I'm so interested in setting up my account. We're going to have to back that up. Things like algorithms that you know use our data, manipulate our data, force advertising into us, I don't think it's healthy. I don't think it's healthy and we've we collectively users and the platform owners we've painted ourselves into a corner in that meta certainly has no motivation to change their business model of monetizing your data and mine they have billions and billions of reasons not to change it it's working you know it's easy to pick on facebook but there are other examples of it but it's creepy to me it's really creepy. You and I have chosen to make this a public conversation, and we did that willingly. So we bear the consequences of what happens when people see this and what their opinion is and what they may say about what I've said. And I accept that. But for young kids to be on a social media platform and acting like young kids, I mean, thank God that there wasn't any observer state like that when I was a young kid, because I wouldn't, I mean, it's horrible. You know, I think that the technology has outstripped human behavior. Do you think sort of software developer entrepreneurs have a code of ethics? Sort of, do you, do you all have kind of an underlying code in a lot of this? Or uh, I think every one of us carries an individual code of ethics. I'm a, I'm a big believer in individual responsibility and individual freedom. Uh, I'm a very, very libertarian view and, and again, I still said, as I said earlier, I believe in people's fundamental goodness. But, you know, sometimes it's hard to see the seminal moment where something went from being a good thing to being a bad thing. It, it's, it may take years to look back and say, wow, that, that was the moment we stepped across the line that we shouldn't have stepped across. So, but I think, I think developers and engineers and product managers and all entrepreneurs, for that matter, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg started out to, you know, manipulate teenagers' feelings of self-worth. I just don't think he did that. I think that this flow of consequences is really kind of an oh shit moment. I, I would like to believe that. I don't think there was any evil intent from the beginning. So the question isn't whether maybe they're right or wrong, but the better question is what are we going to do to change it and, and what alternatives are, are maybe more viable? And uh, it'll sort itself out.
you know, it'll self-correct. I don't know if I answered your question. We're, we're really into the philosophical realm now, though, and I love, I love the way you're thinking about it. Uh, but yeah, I think no. it's, I think, I think we've overshot the mark, Jimbo. That's it. It started out like a good idea. And now all of a sudden we're looking at it going, wow, this isn't really working out the way we <laughs> would have liked. So now we got to fix it. Excellent. And kind of to ask you now kind of about your business and maybe sort of the industry that you're in as a whole, you know, what's sort of the, the next step or the future? I have a stated goal to make code exitos last a hundred years. You know, I'm not going to be around for a hundred years, a real mind bender. And you can, you can work on this and your listeners can work on this on their own. If you start thinking about the actions that you're doing today and what consequences will they have a hundred years from now, it's pretty profound because you realize all of a sudden that let's say, um, I was just talking to one of our engineering managers. He's a brilliant young man. He's got a great future ahead of him. He's not going to be here in a hundred years either. So I can't just say, Hey, you take the company now. I'm going to go off into the sunset. He still has to think about it being a hundred year company because he isn't going to want to hang around or even be able to hang around. So then he's like, Holy cow. Now he has to look around and say, what am I going to do? Like, I don't want to blow it. Right. You don't want to be the guy that gets the year 99 and flakes. <laughs> So, so we're, we're obsessed with this 100-year concept and how do we build this in so that we're always building global skills in the digital world for the next 100 years. That's our personal uh, view of what we want to do with Code Exodus. Well, yeah, the, industry, you know, I, the industry at large. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jimbo. No, I was just commenting on what you're saying. You know, I think that's a really powerful vision and kind of a message. And I think a lot of sort of the team in your business may think about that and push for that strategy. And what I was about to say kind of quickly was, you know, how do you think kind of other business owners can build kind of that mod or mission as strong as the one you've made? Well, it's a very personal choice. And then it becomes part of your, so here's, here's maybe the way to think about it, or at least the way I think about it. Entrepreneurship is a personal endeavor. It's driven by one or a small, very small group of people. It could be Mark Zuckerberg. It could be Charles Fry. It could be Jimbo Paris. But so you have to be, you hope that that entrepreneur is very well grounded and consistent in their own personal beliefs and their own perspective, because that's really the only thing you can only be authentic in your business. If you try to run a business with different values than you, then you've got this, build in stress mechanism and it's no fun for anybody. So now you take the entrepreneur's personality, if you will. And when you take someone's personality and you build it into an organization, that's what we call culture. That becomes the business that becomes the company's culture. And we've seen over the last few years, some of the proverbial bad boy behavior in Silicon Valley, where, you know, the entrepreneur's, personality and behavior wasn't so upright, let's say. And then it, it flowed into the company culture. They were, you know, disrespectful of women and minorities, or they, they were bad stewards of investors money or a lot of bad consequences. So I would say that a company's culture is a derivative of the founder's personality. And that's a big, uh, that's a big responsibility that every entrepreneur takes on. So in my case, and where I am at this stage in my life, the idea of challenging myself and the business to create a hundred year runway for the company, um, it might not fit every other entrepreneur. It may not be their thing. Their thing might be, I want to build this thing up and make it a public company, or I want to build it up and sell it, or I want to build it up and start my own television station. Hmm. Um, and those are all honorable and they're all equally good from a value standpoint, but the, the personality that people have as entrepreneurs flows into their company culture. That's, I just believe that. So I would say it's less about picking the values that I have and trying to make them part of your company. And it's more about working on yourself to be very authentic about what you believe, because you're going to communicate that into your company as you grow it. 
And again, you know, this, again, just to kind of summarize, this has been kind of, this has been a very good interview. And again, thank <laughs> you again. Okay. You're, you're, you're a great host. I mean, your, your questions are fantastic. So uh, I, I enjoyed it. Well, I have one last question for you. So kind of, Wait on um, do you kind of have any final words you like to give to the audience, maybe final pieces of advice and any tokens? Yes. Thank you for asking. I, I have one thing I'd like to share with people. Um, it's very common for people when they meet every day to say, hey, how are you? Right. Jim, how are you? You, know, you hear that a hundred times that the checkout clerk at the grocery store. And I started thinking about this a long time ago and I did my own little social experiment. You've probably accidentally he's seen this where you say something and the person answers and you realize they didn't even listen to what you were saying. They just automatically say, how are you? I have a great day. And they don't really mean it. So when somebody says, hey, Charles, how are you today? I always say the same thing. It's the best day of my life. And I want you to test this, Jimbo. I want you to do it. I want your listeners to do it. The girl at the store, the grocery store, when she's ringing it up, she says, hey, how are you today? And you say, it's the best day of my life. The odds are she's going to say, really? What happened? Did you like win the lottery or whatever? And you're like, no, but yesterday's gone and I can't change it. And I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So today when I woke up, I'm going to make this the best day of my life. Jimbo, I can't tell you how many awesome conversations have flowed out from that simple response. <laughs> and people get it and they make it their own. And, and that's an exciting thing. So the secret is it doesn't always work out. In fact, more times than not, at the end of the day, I go, well, that really did become the best day of my life, but I've got tomorrow. And so for every entrepreneur and every listener, uh, that's my parting thought. Tomorrow or later today, when somebody asks you, hey, how are you doing today? Even if you don't feel like saying it, even if it feels phony, I want you to force yourself to say, it's the best day of my life. And someday, it just might be. All right. Excellent. Thanks, you. Thank you. Thanks, man. We'll see you. So just to end this off here, special sponsor, Judy Ryan, CEO of LifeWork Systems, here to improve sort of the business infrastructure and give you pointers on what to do. Our YouTube channel, subscribe now. And additionally, we have a Roku channel. This will be on Roku. Thank you for listening to the Jimbo Parish Show. 